hello everyone. Good evening. My name is Zaharis. Um, for those who know me personally, they always say that uh, I'm a cyclist. But um, to me, I prefer. I mean, I see myself more as a adventurer and also a risk taker. Uh, just wait for the side. <laughs> Okay, so basically, um, I just want to share a bit of my thoughts, um, a bit of my past experience, and also uh, about my plan okay, after this. Uh, I just want to share a bit about my thoughts now. It's, um, I just want to touch a bit of, about happiness, about my goal, um, what, uh, the way I think. It's like... Um, Okay, it's basically what I think is like, uh, as for me before this, I was a lecturer, I was a lecturer, uh, I'm teaching animation, uh, just like many other people, just like uh, any other people that I actually like, work 9 to 5, I felt bored at one, at one point because it's just like, I feel like I'm living a routine life, um, it's just like doing the same thing again and again and um, working 9 to 5, like, collecting my paycheck every 30 days and the same thing going on 12 times a year and I got bought at some point and I was thinking like um, what is it for this life like I want I want something else like what I see other people they are just uh, trying to get their happiness by they want to get rich where they want to get more pay so that so that they can drive a bigger car they can live in a bigger house this kind of things but to me it's all the same thing so um, to me Happiness, I, I want to get my happiness by having my freedom, by feel free and I don't want to get involved in all this routine life. I want something different. Um, yeah, so basically it's, it's like, um, so, I, I, I want, uh, so at one point of my life I wanted to do something different. I want to get out of this concrete jungle and I want to go to the wild place uh, to travel all around the world. And at one point in my life, which is only a few years ago, uh, 2010, somewhere on May, I just uh, take the risk where I just quit all my job. I, I sold my car, I, I sold everything that I have here in Kuala Lumpur, and I just fly, I, I just flew to China. I just flew to China to Sichuan alone with my backpack and only a few cash. And it all started from there where uh, I flew to Sichuan, uh, uh, to Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan, and from there I bought a bicycle, and I just start cycling from there and try to travel the world with uh, a limited, very limited money and just a bicycle and just travel blindly. I didn't have any experience, and that's when it started for me. <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, I just want to explore the world, and uh, it's very risky, I don't know what's um, the danger will happen in front of me, nothing, I keep on going. And that's when it started. Uh, it lasted me a year, nearly a year, where I, I carry actually like around 50 kilos. Um, around, okay, my luggage is actually basically around 35 kilos with uh, my bicycle. The, this is the bicycle that I bought in Sichuan, in Chengdu. And I finally made it, like I cycled all the way to the Pamir Mountains in Central Asia. The thing that stopped me actually, I had an accident in the Pamir Mountain on my way to Uzbekistan. Um, besides that, uh, just a bit, um, just a simple story that I want to tell about my experience. Um, so what I did, I cycled blindly at first. When I, when I reached China, I didn't even know how to repair a bicycle. I didn't even know how to pitch a tent. Um, and everything was new for me, so when I went there, I didn't even know how to speak Mandarin, nothing. So I went there in China, I just bought a book, Learning Mandarin. <laughs> so I just start learning all the basic words, basic important words, and also uh, just, uh, just for survival. And I went to a bike shop where 
they don't know how to speak English, I don't know how to speak Chinese, but uh, I bought a bicycle and I, I asked them to teach me how to repair the bicycle, I don't know anything about it. And I, I, I told them that I wanted to cycle uh, until Siberia, and they were like laughing at me. Um, and then I told them whether this bicycle can last me until Siberia, and they, they say yes, this bicycle can, but probably you can't. <laughs> I got a bit demotivated, but um, I, I, I was thinking, okay, there's no turning back because I already have nothing in, in KL. I sold everything and I quit everything in KL, so there's no turning back for me. I, I only have to look forward. So I, I just asked them uh, how to repair a bicycle and I went to an outdoor shop and I bought a tent and I asked them, like, how do you pitch this tent? How do you open it? And they, they actually taught me how to do it, so okay, so uh, I just took everything, uh, I went to a bookstore, I bought a map, um, a very detailed China map, which everything is written in Mandarin. So, uh, so I went to an uh, internet shop and I go to Google map and I just try to mis, um, mismatch and okay, so I see like these words, I try to memorize how, uh, how to draw it and I try to memorize on how you want to say it. And I, uh, I stayed a week in Chengdu, uh, learning a bit of Mandarin, learning how to count from 1 to 10. And after a week, I just cycled blindly towards the west, towards Tibet. And the good experience was, um, since I'm not a cyclist, I'm not an athlete, so it was like really tough for me, but it was fine because the first two days, it was like flat road. Um, on the third day, on the fourth day, I, I took a rest. And on the fifth day, I started to climb the Sichuan mountain on my way to Tibet. And it was like very, very tough for me because um, back in Chengdu, it was only 800 meters altitude. And I had to climb for around nearly two weeks to get all the way to 5,000 meters of altitude. And I had many uh, near-death experiences. <laughs> and, but the good thing was um, I had this a big battle inside my inside my inside myself where there was a big battle between my mind and my body it's like my body keep on telling me please stop i'm really tired i want to stop but my mind fought back i i want to keep going i want to reach the top and then go down and at one point um when i was in the lower himalaya i almost died uh, because i i climbed a very steep mountain in the, in the Tibetan mountain and I was on the cloud level, I was inside the cloud level the visibility is zero, it's, I can only see like probably five meters and the rest is all white and I was climbing like very slowly, the road is like uh, probably around two meters like very very narrow and I heard the sound of a bus coming fast <laughs> from the top coming, coming towards me and it's getting louder and louder and I, I was praying that I hope that driver will see me because we are in the cloud level, it was really thick. So I moved to the side and on my side it's just a cliff and it goes down. If I fall, <laughs> basically I will die. So I just prayed to God and I, finally I saw the bus came towards me and the side mirror of the bus hit the side mirror of my bicycle. And oh. it's like, I'm very near to death that time. But um, after that, I felt really alive because <laughs> because the feeling that uh, I was close to death, but I'm still alive. It I, I feel like I'm really alive. Like my soul is really living. Um, and those are like the good things that I learned riding the Himalaya. And also when I reached the top of the mountain, it's like I seen I'm the high. Uh, I'm at the highest point. Of that place that, uh, along that is very dangerous. So what I did, I cycled at night through the mountains, uh, but, it was, but it didn't last long because um, it was really dangerous. Uh, when I came, I heard the sound of wolves, and, <laughs> and while I was there, I I met is I met the, uh, another cyclist uh, from Spain uh, who has been cycling around the world for 11 years, wow. all around the world, and he already cycle for more than 100,000 kilometers. He was still alive. He has <laughs> still alive. So he met me and he told me uh, he decided to go back to Sichuan. 
from Tibet because he tried as well and he said it's too, it's way too dangerous. So we, we actually ended up uh, cycle back to the Sichuan province and from there we cycle north. We cycle north towards Qinghai and after, for, for after a few days we depart ways because uh, this Spanish guy uh, was heading to, towards Mongolia and I was heading towards Kazakhstan at that time. So um, what happened um, after I reached the Qinghai Plateau, I went down to the Taklamakan Desert. Uh, I actually cycled, I, I was crossing 600 kilometers of no man's land in the Taklamakan Desert. And it was like, it was like really difficult for me. It's even harder than climbing Tibet because um, I had a sandstorm, a mini sandstorm. And also I was cycling for under like 52 Celsius. It was like really hot and there was nothing in between, no trees, no shade, nothing. It was only the road and uh, I was surrounded by dunes, dunes, dunes and dunes. So uh, it was nothing in between. I carried around 12 liters of water. Uh, and I had to cross that 600 kilometers which took, which took me around a week to cross. And my water finished all uh, within two days. And at one point, I almost died there. <laughs> and because I was sick, because um, I keep on drinking, it was too hot. And because I keep on drinking, I, I didn't have this appetite uh, to eat. And I don't really eat, and I keep cycling. And I don't have energy anymore at that time. And I was lying at the roadside, uh, asking for help, but I didn't see any cars passing by. But luckily, at one point, um, there's a convoy of China army, they are heading towards India. <laughs> so they saw me at the roadside alone and they, they came to my aid. Um, they were really nice people, they were start speaking Chinese, which I can't really understand, they were speaking too, too fast. And I was asking for water, I was asking for milk, and I just keep on, I just, I just said like the basic words like, uh, new nai, new nai. And, uh, and they were like really nice to me and they were like, ah, oh, kui, kui, kui. And they gave me food, they gave me uh, dry food, naan, they gave me milk, Red Bull. <laughs> and so from there, I actually survived um, crossing this desert and I actually reached the step of Mongolia. Who took this picture? Uh, myself. I have a travel oh. everything. Yeah. So basically, that's uh, some of the experience, and, uh, and uh, basically, I didn't have any ending point. I just, I just ride. When I see roads, I just keep on, keep on riding. And um, so basically, like uh, this is how I took a rest. I was tired, and some of. When I was in Kazakhstan, uh, it was like near winter, uh, where I had to camp like really, really cold. It was like minus 20, minus 25. And also, um, I, I also had this uh, frostbite because I live here most of the time uh, in my life where I never had this kind of experience. It's very hot here. So while I was there, I don't know what to do when it's cold. So at one point, I almost, had, uh, I almost caught frostbite on my fingers where all my fingers turned red, like really red, and some parts becoming bluish. And it was like really, really painful. I never had this kind of pain in my whole life. And I ran to the road, and finally I saw this lorry at the roadside. And the engine is on, so I just ran to the lorry and just put my both my hands. Except the lorry, I didn't care about the driver. <laughs> yeah, but uh, those are some of my experience um, before this. And also, yeah, the good thing, okay, those are the bad things, <laughs> what I told you, but the good things is the feeling of freedom. Um, I feel really good because um, I carry, I, I didn't have much things, all the things that I carry is all that I need, like food, I carry on my stove, everything, my cooking equipment, my camping equipment, outdoor equipment, uh, clothes. So uh, I become less, what, uh, how do you call it? Um, less materialistic because I can't buy things. If I buy things, I, that means I'm going to cycle uh, pulling heavy stuff. So I just live my life like this and I kind of like it because it's like very simple. I don't have much problem and I don't possess many things. Since I don't possess many things, I felt 
I felt really good because I knew that um, nobody gonna come and drop me because I have nothing. <laughs> and as you can see, like usually most of the time the way I wear is like I just wear like a poor people like a beggar. So I just I, I like to do it like that so that when people when local people they see me they, they are not interested to drop me. So just in terms of security. <laughs> and um, another good thing is like the landscape is really breathtaking. It's really nice, and and also uh, and also the the culture that I see. The good thing about traveling with bicycle is that um, I'm I can travel freely anytime I want, uh, and I was all alone. and And since uh, I uh, since I was all alone, so like local people when they see me traveling alone and like really hard like cycling. They they came to me and they always offer me to live in, to live with them all this. So like um, while I was travel while I was traveling very slowly with bicycle, it was like very detailed. Instead of taking a tedious bus ride to get you from city to city, I travel like very slowly from village to village, kilometer to kilometer. And I I can see the change of the landscape very slowly. I can see the change of the people very slowly. When I started my journey in Sichuan, everyone speaks Mandarin. But when I cycle slowly, day by day, I can start seeing uh, people start to exchange. Like uh, they change from saying Ni Hao to Tashi you know. And from there, I start to see more Tibetan and more Tibetan. And from the west, when I go up towards the north, um, from the Tibetan culture, from saying Tashi then I can see more people start saying Ni Hao again. And when I Go more to the north. From people start saying me how they say assalamu alaikum, and you can start seeing uh, Muslim people along the way. And I cycle around 5,000 kilometers in China alone, and it's not even part of China. But to me, I it feels like I travel in like four to five countries because China, the culture is very diverse. Like I've seen so many culture there, so many type of people, so many race. So many people speaking other language, and uh, while I was learning Mandarin, <laughs> it seems that when I was traveling in the northwest of China, um, I don't really use that Mandarin language because most people they don't speak Mandarin over here. Some people they speak Tibetan, some speak Uyghur, <coughs> some of them they speak Tajik, some speak Afghan, and some speak Turkish. So it's um, this culture here is diverse, and I met, uh, I I have the chance to live with all these nomad people. From Tibet, I had the chance to uh, live temporarily with uh, Kazakh nomad, Kyrgyz nomad, Tajik people, and it was like uh, really really cool to live with these people. Like um, um, me coming from this country, like living in the city, I can see that uh, most people, you know, we live in a house and you go outside. Uh, we all carrying a phone, you know, we have we all drive a car. But in these kind of places, they just live in a youth. This um, this thing are called yurta. Um, it's uh, this uh, these are nomad people where, where they um, live. Uh, they move from place uh, from from one place to another. And also they instead of riding a car or motorbike, they just ride horse. You know, and these people. And instead of carrying cell phone, they just carry the stick to beat the horse. <laughs> um, I really like the experience living with these people. It's a uh, totally new thing for me, and I learned so many things from living with these people. And these are some of the local people that I met. Um, these are Tibetan kids, <coughs> really cute, really friendly. But uh, the good thing is, um, they are very friendly, and we keep on talking, but we don't know what we are talking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at first, I tried to speak English, hoping that they can speak English, but they don't speak any of English. They don't even speak Mandarin. They speak Tibetan, and I ended up speaking my own language. I ended up speaking Malay to them, and somehow we just communicate and we understand each other. It's magic. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, this is uh, yeah, and it's worth the effort because I felt so free. I felt I, I felt like. Most of these places that I went is like I was alone most of the time in this world, but I didn't really feel lonely here. I felt like really good. 
uh, going to all these places. And uh, all right, so that's what happened in the past. Um, I just want to share a bit of what I plan to do uh, in the future, where uh, a few days from now, uh, probably a week from now, I'll be starting my new ride again, where I'll be starting my new ride in Iceland, which is a few days from now. I'll be flying to Iceland, and my plan is to ride all the, uh, around Arctic Circle. And um, how it started was, um, I came back from my previous journey a year ago, uh, more than a bit more than a year ago. So uh, what happened was, uh, during last year, during May, I read the news uh, about the volcanoes in Iceland erupted and it was like really huge where the sky covered the uh, I mean the smoke covered the sky as far as Denmark and uh, I also read that all the major airports in Europe had, had to be shut down temporarily so I was thinking why not I cycle in the mountain of fire you know like if other people see it, <laughs> if other people see it as dangerous um, I see it as an opportunity so uh, that's where I plan to, uh, I, I had this plan actually. So um, uh, something I just want to share a bit of my plan. The next one, the next coming one is I, I plan to s travel probably around a year with nothing except my bicycle and my luggage. And I want to, I, I want to start in Iceland probably uh, from Reykjavik. And uh, I want to be in Iceland during summer because I, I want to catch the midnight sun. Um, because that's one of the phenomena that I can never experience here in this country where um, you can see the sun during midnight because it's forever daytime during this time. So uh, I plan to cycle around here for probably around two months or three months and then the next one is I, I want to head to the Arctic uh, from, from the Norwegian side where Probably I will take a ferry or a flight to to Norway. Probably start from Oslo, and I will cycle all around the north, the west fjords here uh, during autumn. And I plan to get uh, to cycle in Arctic probably during the if I can do it, uh, because it's going to be very icy, going to be very cold. But uh, I I was just thinking, yeah, I had this experience before, like uh, I was riding like minus 20, minus 25 Celsius, why don't I just do it again here? <laughs> and I think that's the only hard part. Um, probably here in Best Richard, because, I, because I'm from Malaysia, I can't really uh, take the cold, but why don't I just do it again? And also probably there's, there's polar bears, maybe, but doesn't really matter. Um, because I think uh, this route that I'm doing, the next one is not as dangerous as the one that I did last time in the lower Himalaya and in the Pamir mountains. And so uh, uh, what my plan is like, I will ride in Iceland and then start from Oslo all the way to the north from the Norwegian side and go down to the Lapland here in Finland and finally down to Sweden and ending in Stockholm. But this is just a rough guide for me. Basically, I don't have any guide. I want to be really free. I don't want to have a deadline, nothing. I just want to ride. Feel free without any GPS, nothing, and just keep on riding. Whenever I see the roads, I don't even care uh, where does this road lead me to. I just go, and I will just follow my heart, follow where the wind blows, and yeah, feel free. How long, and, did, how, how long did it take you to travel? To China? Uh, okay, actually, I travel very slowly. Um, it took me around six months to travel around seven thousand kilometers. But my total trip is one year because I stayed six months, uh, five months in Kyrgyzstan. I stayed there. And it ended up because actually I was, um, that time I was planning to cycle all the way to South Africa. And what happened was, um, while I was riding towards Uzbekistan on my way to Iran, I was in the Pamir mountain and at, during the night <coughs> it was snowing really heavily. And the next day when I was cycling, it was really hot, and the road was, uh, it was like, uh, all the snow actually melts, and the road was like really slippery, and I got into a small accident. And when I see the roads, it's like, until the horizon, from where I stand, until the horizon, is all mountains, the Pamir Mountains, and 
I can see Uzbekistan is still far away and I was thinking maybe I just go back to Bishkek and try to find a job there. So you didn't have any problem with the border police? Um, yeah, I do have some problems where I got beaten by police always. <laughs> um, I got beaten by police in China, I got threatened by police in Kazakhstan. So many things happened but it doesn't really matter. Um, some kids, 10 years old kids, tried to steal my bicycle but <laughs> I didn't really care because my bicycle is like very heavy. At that time I was carrying like 35 kilos and my bike is like 15. And this kid tried to steal my bike in Kazakhstan and he ride for 10 meters and he fell down and he cannot get up again so I have to help him out. <laughs> and I just, I just tell him like, please, steal someone else's bike, you know. <laughs> and the bigger fan is like, um, to me it's not about cycling itself. To me cycling is just a medium of transport. It, to me, I, what I want is like, I want to travel the world, I want to see people, I want to see culture, I want to see the landscape, you know. I like all these things, mountains, and so uh, I think the best way to travel is just by bicycle, it's just that. And this is one of uh, my plan where, I mean in the years to come, oops, in the years to come, I plan actually to cycle all around the world where um, I got really motivated when I saw the Spanish cyclist from Spain. Um, he cycled for all over the world and he never go back to Spain for 11 years and he cycled through Africa and his, his experience is much more compared to me. So I wanted, you know, I wanted to spend this life something like that and keep traveling and keep on traveling. And this is the big plan where I had to basically just to ride all over the world. Um, in, the, in all the continent if I can by bicycle because it's very detailed. But I won't be forcing myself because it's too difficult then probably I just take train. <laughs> <laughs> but as, if, if possible I will just cover everything with bicycle. I want to go very detailed. And so basically that's the big plan. Probably it will take lifetime to me but it doesn't really matter. It's not a way to And uh, lastly it's just that uh, this is some of my... Uh, I collaborated with these companies. And this is some of my sponsors. And also, uh, please check out my Twitter, Zaharis K, and also my blog, uh, Zaharis, Z A H A R I Z, dot WordPress, dot com. Uh, I had all the stories there, and I, I will be updating uh, the stories after this. Um, a week from now, well, I'll, be, I'll start cycling And, uh, yeah, so basically, my Twitter. Oops. Yep, so basically this is my Twitter. And that's all.